hi there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. You will notice a very unusual situation. My lovely, sweet, patootie wife Alice is sitting out there instead of being up here with me. Here, by the way, being on the navigator of the seas out in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean, as we're crossing back from our travels in England and Europe and back to the United States. And having mentioned that, you may hear a squeak, a groan or two. That's not me, it's not the people that are sitting here, that's the ship itself. Uh, that's because the ship is going a little bit like this. But that's all right, we can deal with this. This is our 81st program in the series. And we've just completed our look at the Sermon on the Mount. And the reason we study, we spent I think 40 weeks in the Sermon on the Mount, is because if we're going to look for true biblical faith, if we're going to look for true Christianity, I believe you have to you have to understand what something is. You have to be able to define it if you're going to search for it. And the teaching of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount is true Christianity. And if what you see out there doesn't line up with what's in there in the Sermon on the Mount, you're looking at something that's a counterfeit and not true Christianity. Yes, it's as simple as that. So, before I start, get into it more, I just want to do this. I want to say, Father, I just want to ask that you bless our time in your word. And Lord, that you would not allow anything to come out of my mouth that you have not put in my heart, Lord God. And that everybody that hears it, including me, Lord God, would be touched by your word, by the power of your love. And I ask that, Father, in the precious, the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, for those past 40 some odd weeks that we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount and saying, okay, how does Christianity out there, how does it look in comparison to that? We're going to do something a little bit different. Because now, rather than kind of looking out the window into the church in the world, we're going to turn it around and look in the mirror. Because if we're looking for true Christianity, the most important place to look for is in our own lives. So we're going to call this study the evidence of a redeemed life. Because if you have been redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, it should be evident in your life. Amen. And the folks out there said, Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. So, there are two principal things that we're going to consider here. The first is understanding how to examine ourselves. How are we going to how are we going to be how we're instructed to look into our own lives to see whether what we're doing lines up with the word of God. And the second thing is we have to ensure that we are presenting Jesus Christ to the world the way that we're supposed to be, the way the Lord intends us to. So that's the focus here, all right? To look for that, to look for that Christianity in our own lives. There is a foundational truth that this study is going to be built upon. And that is this. If Jesus were here, well, he is. Peace be still, see? In the flesh, this is the foundational truth. In the flesh, in the natural, we are all the children, the offspring of Adam. And we carry in the flesh the evidence of his life. Because the sins of the Father are passed on generation to generation, on and on, ad infinitum. Well, you can say, well, it says for four generations. Well, of course. But that keeps passing on, father to father, right? And like Adam, we are all condemned to death in the flesh. Isn't that what Jesus, the Lord said to him? He said, if you eat from that tree, that day you'll die. The wages of sin is death. Right? So, he continued to say, after Paul said in Romans, that the wages of sin is death, he said, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. It does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. 
and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's Romans 8, verses 6 through 8, right? The simple truth is that those who are in the flesh, walking according to the flesh, cannot help but do the deeds of the flesh, the things of the flesh, displeasing as they are to the Lord. It said, Paul said, they're not even able to do so. So they are cursed with a curse that they will live a life according and doing the deeds of the flesh. Right? Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, Paul said, writing to the Galatians. These are the deeds of the flesh, and I'm going to be reading from Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 19. Immorality, idolatry, strife, disputes, envying, impurity, sorcery, jealousy, dissensions, drunkenness, sensuality, enmities, outbursts of anger, factions, and carousing. And these things, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those traits, those behaviors, are not only evident, like he says, they are the evidence. They're the, the evidence of a life lived according to the flesh, under the generational curse. You understand generational curses? The sins of the father will be passed on to the children, right? And the children's children. That's in Exodus 34, verse 7. Well, how, how in the world can you deal with that? I mean, it's like you're locked into, you're cursed with a curse from God that these things are going to be the evidence of your life in the flesh. Those behaviors, those deeds, is what the world is accustomed to. You know, we look at them, if, we're, if you're redeemed, you look at those and they become horrific to you. But that's what the world expects, because that's what the world is accustomed to. And like it or not, it's what they understand and expect. In many cases, those deeds of the flesh are what the world enjoys and supports. That's exactly right. Well, I can't tell you what it's like. We've spent the last seven months over in Europe, in England, and you know, you turn on the television, turn on the telly for those of you from the UK, and you see sin promoted in the most obnoxious places. I mean, I can't believe that we see homosexuality in advertising for banks, for restaurants, on television shows that have nothing to do with relationships. Because what used to be prohibited is now promoted. And that's the truth. I read and I am reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. But in those deeds of the flesh that Paul is talking about, there's a couple that I really wanted you to have an understanding of because it's so important. Where the New American Standard said immorality. The Greek word that's used there is porneia. That's where we get our English word pornography. When he talked about sorcery, the Greek word that's used there is pharmakia, which is drugs. The King James talks about murder. Now, I don't know how well you know the scriptures, but it might do you well to go to Revelation chapter 9 and see that God talks about in those last days that there will be and those are exactly the Greek words that are used. There will be pornography, there will be drugs, and there will be murder, and men will not repent of them. That's the time we're living in. That's why this study is so important, is to understand the difference between the deeds of the flesh and the deeds of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit, and we need to be examining ourselves and making sure that we are living a life that is pleasing to God. You don't want to find out the hard way. Remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about in the end of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said people come to him. People come to him. Not just people. People who will believe that they are the servants of God saying, Lord, Lord, look what I did in your name. I did this in your name. I did that in your name. And he says, depart from me, you evil ones. I never 
knew you. How can you get so deceived? The simple answer is pride. You know, I, I don't want to rehash what I've talked about so much in the past, but it is important. Paul talks about the fact that salvation is the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, those people who go to Jesus on that day of judgment and say, look what I did, they are boasting in their works, which can not save. Salvation is the free gift of God, bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, but I'm not going to talk. But the scriptures say, in these perilous last days, men will not repent. Have you heard any issues with drugs, with pornography, with murder? Well, if you haven't, if you turn on the news, now we, you, you know, we have 24-hour-a-day news from all over the world. Turn it on. You know what you're going to see? Drugs, pornography, murder. That's exactly what you're going to see. And it should be a clue to the times we live in. And you need to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Okay. The people in the world, the people who are walking according to the flesh, see, they don't understand. Surely they don't even care that God spoke through the prophet Isaiah so long ago and said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's Isaiah 5.20. We're living in a time when what's evil is called good, what's good is called evil. Understand, we are in the last days, the perilous last days. You see, that's the generational curse that flows through the offspring of Adam for all time. For all time. And there's only one way to break that generational curse. If the sins of the father are visited upon children, the only way you can deal with generational curse is to change fathers. I changed fathers. I was born again. Right? So our ability to live that new life, okay, is demonstrated when Nicodemus, the Pharisee, came to Jesus Christ. He came in the dark of night because he was uh, concerned about who would see him talking to Jesus. So he came in the night to question Jesus, and Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3. Unless you change fathers, unless you accept that gift of being born again by a father who is in heaven, who is spotless, who is holy, who is pure, who has no sin to pass on to you, has no curse. The only thing that God the Father can pass on to you is blessings and righteousness through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. And then he went on to say to Nicodemus, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. John 3, 6. The redeemed of the Lord, who have been born again, then have a new heavenly father. Whose spirit. That's what Jesus said John, in John 4, right? Our father is spirit. So you have new life. If you have new life in Jesus Christ, the first thing you should be doing is hallelujah. You should be having a hallelujah party. You should be having a hallelujah hoedown. Because see, you're not subject anymore to those deeds of the flesh. And before you accept Jesus Christ, before you're born again, you don't have a choice. That's why I said you're not even able to do this. You're enslaved to that enemy who came to kill, to steal, to, to destroy. Jesus, the first thing he says, I came to set the captives free. He set you free. He set me free. Free from the curse of the, curse of the law. The curse of the law was death. Hallelujah. So if you have new life in Jesus, you might want to write this down. You better have a new lifestyle. Because a new life in Jesus Christ demands a new lifestyle. And so it is written, Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of the, of the seed. Ephesians 4.22. You've got to lay that aside. It's a choice. 
Let me just say this about choices. What you believe will determine your choices. What you choose will determine your life. So, having been commanded and empowered to lay aside that old self, we should, and this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize, do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. We are called to examine ourselves. And that's what we're doing here in this study, is examining ourselves to see if we're in the faith. That's the Word of God. So hallelujah. I mean, let's, let's do what the Word of God says. Uh, can you agree on that? So our ability to live this new life and walk according to the Spirit, which is what we're supposed to do in Romans 8, right? It's based on knowing that we have the power to do so. Because as Paul wrote to the, to the Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who liveth within me. Galatians 2.20. So you have the power to live this new life. I hear so many people say to me, listen, I've been doing this a long time. And I don't say, well, you know, that's the way I've always been. Get over it! It's not the way you've always been. It's the way you always were. Until the moment that you said yes to Jesus Christ. That you said yes to the Father. And then that old you is dead and gone. I was here not, not long ago while we were over in England. It was my birthday. I had my 73rd birthday while we were over this year. And people say, do you celebrate, celebrate your birthday? And I said, no, I don't celebrate my birthday. I celebrate my funeral. See, because I was so blessed, I got saved on my birthday. I guess... God thought it would be the only way I could remember what date it was, and I don't know. So if I got born again on, the, on my birthday, that was the day that I died. i got to tell you, it wasn't so bad. It's not so terrible to die. Because then you walk into the promise, and the promise is, if you believe in me, Jesus said, you'll never die. The gift of God, the free gift of God, is eternal life. So hallelujah. You're not the old you. This is why the Apostle Paul, a murderer down in his heart, a hater of God and the things of God in truth and in spirit, would say, forgetting what lies behind, I push on towards the goal of the upward call in Christ Jesus because you're new creation in him. You never, never, never can use that excuse of what you used to be. And I'm going to say this again because it's a, I love to say it. Excuses are the fiery arrows that are shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. As long as you make an excuse, you'll never repent. Start confessing, start professing what you are in Christ Jesus. A new creation, hallelujah. To put it bluntly, that means that we're not living the new lifestyle. We are without excuse. And the only correct course of action is repentance. To repent. I can tell you, a lot, of, a lot of places, a lot of the biggest churches in the United States of America, and this has, has traveled back uh, east is that way, and infected other places, they don't preach repentance anymore. Because that turns people off. They don't talk about sin because that turns people off. You know what? If you're listening to this and you don't know Jesus Christ, if you haven't accepted him, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the good news. But the good news starts with this. You are a dirty, rotten sinner condemned to death. See, that may sound like bad news, but if there's no bad news, who needs good news? If you don't recognize the fact that you're a sinner condemned to death, you don't need a Savior. And Christ came to save you. He came to take your place and take that sin, that death, out of your life. So the good news has to start with the bad news. And if people are afraid to preach the bad news because it turns people away, it's not comfortable, they're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're preaching something man-made. Okay. Like I said, we need to reject excuses. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. Whom he has redeemed from the land, hand of the adversary. You know, people think that I'm nuts. 
Well, I am. I'm a little crazy for Christ. I'm a little loony for the Lord, and I'm not ashamed of that. Because we'll go to a grocery store, and somebody will ask me, you know, it's like, it, this, how are you? People, how many people this week ask you how you are? They don't care. They really don't care. Somebody asks me, how are you? I say, I'm redeemed. How are you? They look at me and they say, how are you? I say, I'm safe. Safe and secure from all alarm. I'm not concerned about ISIS. I'm not concerned about Russia. I'm not concerned about China. I'm not concerned about Iran. I'm not concerned about the mugger down the street. I am safe and secure from all alarm because I am in the hand of the one who saved me. People say, how are you? I say, I, 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 am, I am eternal. Hallelujah. I'm eternal because of the work of Jesus Christ on a little hill outside of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago I'm gonna live forever I say this in grocery stores I say and, they, and people step back and say what and you know what I get a chance to share my testimony and I share my testimony every place that God gives me a chance because you know the Saints overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony because they did not love their lives even unto death don't don't worry about whether somebody likes you. Don't worry about whether somebody thinks you're respectable or not. Jesus' own family said he's lost his senses. The religious people of his day said he's demon-possessed. Oh, what great company you're in when they start to rebuke you and revile you. Hallelujah. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and set free from the curse of the flesh. Before that, we were in opposition to God. Isn't that what it said? Opposition to God. If there's somebody you don't want to fight with, let me tell you, it's God. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. Ah, so we have been saved from the snare of the devil, having been held captive to do his will. We've been set free. Hallelujah. So now we got to take the test. All right, we've got to take the test. And you have to be willing to be honest and take the test. You know, it's, it's easy to judge other people. This which is why Jesus said, don't judge the others. Take the log out of your own eye before you take, take the speck out of your brother's eye. We have to be willing to take the test. We have to be willing to look at ourselves honestly and say, does our life line up with the word of God? Because that's the only test is the word of God. You're always going to be judged by other people. Jesus was always tested by other people. Everybody gets examined. Everybody gets tested. It says, I'm going to read this to you. This is John chapter 9. The account of a man born blind. In the 16th verse, it says, Therefore some of the Pharisees were saying, This man, Jesus, is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. This is the religious leaders saying, saying Jesus He's not from God. But the fact of the matter is, who sent him into the world? For God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So a second time, these same Pharisees, they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man. Again, talking about Jesus. We know this man is a sinner. How did they know he was a sinner? These were the most highly educated religious people of the time. They knew he was a sinner because they said he didn't keep the Sabbath. Let me just tell you something and make sure you understand this. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. He never, ever, 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 ever broke the law. He never broke the law. You know what he broke? He broke their traditions of the law. It was the, re, the traditions of those religious people that he didn't keep. And it was for that that they condemned him. And boy, did they condemn him. They had come to believe that their traditions, the traditions that they had created and held so dear, carried the same weight as the word of God. So Jesus said to those Pharisees, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you're experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Mark 7, 8, and 9. That's what we're about. 
We need to find out what we're doing that is religious tradition and what we are doing that is the Word of God. And we need to embrace the things that we're doing according to the Word of God. We need to grow in those things, and we need to put aside the traditions of men that are not the Word of God, and they cause us to put aside the Word. The, the Pharisees found him guilty. Pontius Pilate tried Jesus Christ and didn't find him guilty and said, crucify him. But God the Father tested him and he said, behold, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. There's only one who tests you that matters, and that is the Father in heaven. And those are the words you need to hear. You need to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Are you being tested? How are you going to test yourself? Don't test yourself according to tradition. Tra tradition. Let me just give you something. When people look at you and they try and figure out if you're a Christian or not, they may ask you, how often do you go to church? People ask me, you know, what church do I go to? What church do I belong to? I don't belong to a church. I belong to Jesus Christ. I was purchased with a price. I am the church. We need to get the truth and get it down in our hearts. How much do you tithe? Does that determine whether you're a Christian or not? Did you put Christ back in Christmas? Does that make you a Christian? Do you belong to the right denomination? Does that make you a Christian? Do you eat the right food? Do you wear the right clothes? What are the things that test you? There are far too many of those traditions. There are too many of those questions to ask here. And they simply don't matter in any event. As if our redemption actually was based on those things. As a matter of fact, it's often those very things that hide the light of Christ in our lives from the world. Is those traditions of man. And that's a fact. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. For does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. While Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount that we are to be the light of the world, those traditions of men are the very basket that hides the light of God in our lives. Our purpose here, in but not of this world, is to show forth the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's what the Apostle Peter wrote in his second letter. But thanks be to God, who always... By the way, I don't know what language you speak. Or, I mean, Alice and I are talking about the fact that we're, we, we don't speak English, we speak American. We're learning to speak English. But I'll tell you, whether you're in England or in... You know what always means? Always! He leads us always in triumph in Christ Jesus. If you're not walking in the triumph of Christ Jesus, you better examine your life. You better find out what's going on in your life. And you better start to get back into the Word and walk like Christ Himself lived within you. Like you truly are the temple of the Spirit of God. The very power of God. Men and women in the world, they can't see your spirit. But men judge by outward appearance. We're going to talk about in the next program how men should judge you and how you should judge yourself. It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Not the deeds of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit. So don't you miss that. Be back here next week and see. And there won't be any squeaks probably. God bless you and goodbye. I lay down